Okay, um, welcome everyone to the monthly seminar series of the Hague Programme on International Cybersecurity at Leiden University. Uh, my name is Monica Kaminska and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the programme. Today we're incredibly lucky to have Max Smeets talking about his forthcoming book, so no, no Shortcuts, Why States Struggle to Develop a Military Cyber Force. Max is a senior researcher at the Centre for Security Studies at ETH Zurich, the director of the European Cyber Conflict Research Initiative and an affiliate at Stanford's Center for International Security and Cooperation. Max's book is coming out on the 26th of May in Europe, um, and I have had the immense pleasure of reading it already, so I thoroughly, thoroughly recommend it. Um, go order it. Um, without any further delay, I'll hand over to Max. Um, basically, the format will be um, Max will speak uh, for, I guess, about half an hour. I think, is that okay, Max? Yeah? Yeah, sounds good. And then we'll move on to Q&A. Um, we prefer people to just put their hands up and then they can ask their questions themselves, but you can always uh, post them in the chat as well. Um, and I'll relay them at the end. So yeah, Max, over to you. Perfect, thank you, Monica. And thank you for organizing this also to, to Dennis, Corian, and everyone else involved in the, the program in The Hague. Um, yeah, so I got the book, book today, actually. I'm very happy I haven't, I haven't opened it, I do not dare to do so, afraid that I will find a typo on like page two or three, um, but uh, at least it's good to have a physical copy uh, in my hands and, uh, and see that actually this, this work uh, is now produced. Um, so um, for this talk, the way I've planned it is basically in three parts. The first part provides a very brief kind of overview of what led me to write this book and set up the puzzle in a way. And then the second part talks about the, the more general overview of the book. And then the third part uh, delves into one chapter uh, in more detail. So it kind of provide a kind of gradual um, progression here as, uh, as the talk unfolds. So what's, what's the setup here? Well, the book, um, the book starts with a dual observation. And the first observation is that we have seen a great deal of institutionalization of military cyber efforts over the past two decades. Now we can visualize this in a number of different ways by the number of national cybersecurity and particularly cyber defense strategies that have been published and countries becoming more vocal about potentially the need to develop also offensive cyber capabilities all through looking at military cyber commands and their establishment, and perhaps the variation thereof uh, as well, where in both cases, we've seen a quite an exponential increase, particularly since 2012, but in some cases already before that. So there seems to be this growing um, desire to operate for the militaries in the, in the cyber domain and potentially um, develop a capacity to not just do what we normally say uh, CNE, computer network um, exploitation, espionage, uh, that is often in the realm of intelligence agencies, but perhaps also do more CNA, computer network attack, or what is now most frequently called, and the way I use it, cyber effect operations, those that seek to disrupt, deny, degrade, and or destroy. At the same time, whilst we have seen this development, we also have to recognize that the majority uh, that we actually see very few countries conducting cyber effect operations. Now, of course, we don't have a perfect view um, of what is going on today, but through the current databases that exist, you would say that actually we get to a much smaller number, perhaps a dozen or so countries that are known to have been highly active in this domain where militaries are conducting um, cyber effect ops. Um, this is, of course, supported by anecdotal evidence when we look at a wide range of NATO countries where parliamentary reports or interviews with, uh, with generals um, kind of confirm this statement. Uh, you may find this in, in, in German uh, report uh, from parliament, but also um, the Dutch uh, have actually been quite um, uh, uh, open in a number of different fora on uh, at least the DCC, the Dutch uh, Defense Cyber Command, not yet having at least independently conducted any uh, operations and certainly not effect operations. Now, the current literature has gone very much in one direction to explain this, perhaps not so explicitly, but certainly implicitly. And so where is the current literature today, the academic literature? Well, one direction would basically focus very much on this lack of um, 
potential to use cyber operations for coercive purposes. So an early statement from Adam Liff um, is, you know, state led cyber operations um, uh, have rarely been conducive to change the behavior or influencing the bargaining power between states. So, you know, it could be an explanation why you may want to not do uh, cyber effect operations. The other argument um, that has been prominent, of course, is this notion around intelligence contest, which perhaps comes from, from Thomas Ritt's early observation that state-led cyber operations uh, are not cyber war, but merely variations of uh, age-old sabotage, espionage, and subversion. It's an argument that has become, I would say, more prominent in recent years, with also some terrific work done by one of my colleagues, uh, Lena Mashmeyer here at CSS. There are other uh, connected explanations, albeit they are different. One that I've made myself with uh, Richard Hognett, that, you know, it's not too much about these high level cyber effect ops, but instead we should look at what is going on below the threshold of armed attack, because that activity can cumulatively still be strategically meaningful. Following that argument, you could argue, well, states, again, don't have to do cyber effect operations. One other explanation we'll find in the literature is around cross-domain deterrence. That point has been most clearly made by John Lindsay, um, where I've now put a quote here for him. Uh, he says, at the high end, there is no activity because not even the actors with the ability to launch a digital Pearl Harbor have the motivation to do so. Deterrence works just not everywhere. We see a lot, a lot of little attacks and a little uh, of a lot. The last potential key explanation um, is uh, around norms, where uh, the argument would be, well, yeah, we haven't seen it because there's shared expectations, at, at, at least by a significant community, to, not, to not conduct such a type of activity. Now, the makes a different point. So whereas the existing literature very much assumes that states can participate in cyber conflict so that they have crossed the barriers of entry, this book's question this assumption. So it starts from the, from the first focus on, let's look at what is required for states to conduct uh, cyber effect operations. So it looks at, whereas perhaps, looks at the opportunity and ability to conduct these activities. Sorry, Max, to interrupt you. Your slides are not um, progressing. Um, I just wanted to make you aware of that. Um, ah, all right. Uh, that's uh, too bad. <laughs> um, so I, shall we? I see that my screen sharing has been paused. I, I haven't done that myself. I don't know uh, if someone can change that. Let me have a look. Mm. Let me see if I can do this again. I share a different screen. Oh, no, that's perfect. All right. So, All right sorry. so I don't know where you've lost me. But I, I created this beautiful kind of thing here with this really nice overview that shows what the existing literature is and then where my book stands. And so whereas the, the existing literature has very much focused uh, or basically assumes that states can participate in cyber conflict and have crossed the barriers of entry, then look at, you know, why wouldn't you do them? Uh, assuming that states can, my research here questions this assumption. You can see it now, right? Good. Yes, yes. Okay. So, um, so the argument uh, that I'm making, and there's actually, it's a chain of arguments that I'm making, but in the simplest terms, is that I would argue that states struggle to develop a military cyber force, and that the time and resources required um, uh, to conduct cyber effect operations are much higher than often appreciated. Now, how do I go about this in the book? Of course, there's first a part around definitions, data, and historical trends that lays out what we see today. But then first, what I'm doing is saying, okay, let's have a look at the different requirements per actor, because different constraints of actors leads to different requirements. The majority of countries that have established a military cyber command, however, are rather significantly constrained in both their operational, legal, and strategic setup. And for that, uh, and, and I showcase that they, whilst they are highly constrained, have limited resources. What I then do is set up a framework to understand capability requirements. I call this the PATIO framework, People, Exploits, Tools, Infrastructure, and Organization. I'll explain that a little bit more in a second. Now, that's fine. That is a static framework. And someone could argue that's, a, that's nice to have, but some of these elements can change over time as potentially organizations uh, develop further. And so the next step to do 
is to look at the changes over time, where I heavily draw on the literature in business economics to look at what we call learning curve effects, how repetition changes the ability to conduct cyber operations more efficient. And I look at three elements, which is the first one is, is, is learning, the second one is scale, uh, and the third one is technology and how technology changes that. But that is still very much internal. So we then need to look at the external dimension as well, of course, because perhaps you can't do it, but hey, there are external actors that can provide it. The way that I've set this up is to first look at the incentives for intentional transfer of cyber capabilities between states. That's of course connects to a huge literature in international relations on arms transfer. Then I look at the limits of unintentional capability transfer. Okay, maybe it's limited to do so, you know, intentionally, but perhaps leaks, intelligence connection, and a couple of other elements that I discuss can provide unintentional capability transfer. And they can certainly do to a degree, but not to the extent to give you a full capacity. And then last, whilst this is between states, I look at the role of non-state actors, where I discuss particularly the focus around market failures and to show actually that the, that this, the market that exists is way less efficient than some people purport it to be. Now, what I do, what I want to do for the remainder of this talk as we don't have too much time, is to very briefly touch upon chapter five, because you need to have an idea of what are capabilities actually, what are we talking about? And then to talk about um, the incentives for states to intentionally transfer cyber capabilities. So basically picked out kind of one and a half chapters for the remaining uh, 13, 14 minutes. Um, I'm happy to, to talk about the other ones in the Q&A or, uh, or, or at any other point in time, and I'm certainly will do in the future. So let me very briefly touch upon chapter five. I've written already a little bit on this, but I wanted to make sure that people have a clear understanding of capabilities. So I set up this framework, which I call the PATIO framework. And that's based on those five elements, people, exploits, tools, infrastructure, and organization. It helps people understand the requirements because too often, they discuss cyber capabilities in the abstract. They maybe show a cool photo of, I don't know, whatever they, uh, a keyboard uh, that supposedly can blow up things, but rarely do we actually explain what's behind it. But we need it to explain those other elements and how they can change over time and how they can be transferred, of course. So the people. So um, it, 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 a, to develop a capacity requires a wide range of different people. It requires your technical uh, experts and then a more diverse group. And I've tried to briefly put them on here. So when we look at the people, uh, which is the most important element, you've got your vulnerability analysts, sometimes called bug hunters. Then you've got your developers and operators, sometimes combined with DevOps, your system administrators um, that also help with the reliable upkeep and so on of your, uh, your, your tooling. And then your testers, sometimes these are combined. Um, of course, whilst this is the, the group that is often conceived as the hackers uh, for an effective uh, cyber command, you need a much more diverse group of, of, of the talent um, to actually be effective. Um, so I've put them here in a number of different roles. Uh, I won't go through all of them in, in much detail, but what is already shows if people are the most important element, it means in the long-term future, Retainment, training, and, uh, and, and, and of course, recruitment in the first place are potentially the most three most crucial elements of developing an offensive cyber capability. And actually, that's quite significantly linked to the strategy uh, that some countries have as well. We can discuss it in more detail. All right. And the second element uh, are exploits. Uh, for those unfamiliar, uh, we tend to distinguish between three different types of exploits, of which the first one we most often hear about, the zero days, those are exploits um, that exposes uh, software vulnerability not yet known to the vendor. Then you've got unpatched end days. And those are exploits that expose a vulnerability in software that is known to the vendor but does not have a patch in place to fix the flaw yet. And then you've got the patched end days that sometimes can still be used. Um, those are exploits that expose a vulnerability in software or hardware that is known to the vendor and has a patch in place to fix the flaw. Now, Whilst there is a common understanding that um, states run on this engine of zero days, particularly the mature actors, um, it's pretty clear that that's a 
somewhat of a myth. It's not to say that zero-day exploits can be a good indicator of potential maturity or sophistication of an actor, but what uh, mature actors tend to focus on is ultimately better understanding the target than the target knows itself. And through that, it can often use um, NDA exploits or uh, no exploits at all to gain access. Um, it's a very good quote from, uh, from Rob Joyce um, that has discussed this at a conference uh, called Enigma and would highly recommend you to have a look at it. It's found on, uh, on YouTube as well, where it discusses this element in more detail. Now, the third element is the toolbox. Um, so the toolbox uh, refers to the set of computer programs used to create, debug, maintain, or otherwise support other programs or applications. And they are normally part of a larger tool a chain to, to uh, execute um, or perform a certain operation. Now, somewhat similar to uh, exploits, you've got a similar trade-off where on the one hand, yes, it might be useful to use zero days, um, but on the other hand, um, there's a value in using uh, uh, end days. Um, with tools, you have the same. You shouldn't think that the more mature actors only use custom tools. Um, that's because custom tools are harder to detect, but if they are discovered, they're also more expensive and time consuming to replace. So especially early on, you might wanna use more common tools that also can help um, attribution efforts. It's also not the case, which is sometimes kind of mentioned that the more mature actors have this arsenal of tools available. Um, yes, they may have some things on the shelf, if you can call it that way, but equally it's difficult and cost inefficient to kind of build this tool uh, development early on because you don't know about your specific needs at a given point in time. So much more often you build a specific tool for the operation and target that you have in mind at the moment that it has been um, given and selected. I realize I'm rushing through this and apologize a little bit for that, but uh, I hope I can provide some more detail later. Um, so the, the, the fourth element is perhaps the least sexy, but also one of the most important. Uh, it's infrastructure, too often ignored. Um, those are the processes, structures, and facilities needed to pull off an offensive cyber operation. I distinguish between two different types. The first type of infrastructure is what we can call control infrastructure. So that's refers to the processes directly used to run an operation. And that's also often burned after a field or a, a, any operation for attribution reasons, for stealth reasons, or other reasons. So this includes your command and control infrastructure, um, but it can also include other uh, capabilities to keep track of compromised systems and so on. The preparatory infrastructure, that's the stuff that is really, really expensive to build really hard to build, takes a long period of time. And that's the things that you don't actually um, uh, destroy after an operation. Um, so more formally, these are the processes used to put oneself in a state of readiness to conduct cyber operations. That's where the multi-million or sometimes billion dollar budgets are often going to. They're often not going to the exploits where even the most sophisticated actors tend to have budgets of max um, 30 million, 35. Um, and here you showcase particularly for the mature actors the importance of testing um, and the importance of making sure you really understand the target and setting up a training uh, training infrastructure um, as well last point is the organizational element you can look at both the inter-organizational element and the intra-organizational element now absolutely essential of course uh, for anyone aware in this domain is the link between intel and military but that also comes with often trade-offs, both pros and cons as to how you're integrating them. It can lead, on the one hand, to more efficient allocation of tools, but for instance, one of the trade-offs and the limits of it is, is that a too much overlap can also increase the risk of exposure. We've seen this with a couple of operations, particularly early on from the US around the equation group. There's also a tension at the organizational level that you commonly observe, which is between on the one hand, creating routines that allow for stability, but also making sure that there is sufficient individual flexibility for the operator to operate in a space where ultimately deception is the most crucial thing where you wanna allow for creativity. It's an ongoing challenge there. Okay, so this is a very brief overview of like, what are we talking about actually when we are developing these capabilities? Now we can move to the, the more, the analysis that I've set up in each of those chapters, the more theoretical analysis uh, and explanatory. So the one I focus on here is on intrastate um, 
transfers. When we normally think about military technology, you can distinguish between four different types of technology. This is not my topology, but a well-used one, uh, particularly by, by Keith Cross. The first type of technology is the most basic. That's the engineering, economic, and organizational capacity needed to operate and maintain weapons and their related effects. And the second one becomes already a bit more advanced. That's the capacity needed to reproduce or copy the weapons. The third one is to refine weapons. And the fourth one is to really be at the forefront of uh, the production frontier. Now, normally when you look at the transfer of arms, there is both a high opportunity and high willingness to transfer type one and a little bit less type two, less type three, and less type four. So there's low opportunity and willingness to transfer um, you know, the, giving other countries the opportunity to advance to the production frontier. There are a number of different reasons that you can find in the literature. Um, so the opportunity side, you know, why do you want to give other countries simply the usage of capability of because there are relatively low barriers, uh, little local capital and expertise is often needed. Biddle has some, uh, some caveats there um, for those familiar with his work, but it also strengthens the industrial base at home. Uh, it can lock in alliances due to dependency, all of those elements. Now, that changes, of course, with the other forms of technology where you're way less likely to transfer uh, type three and type four type of technology because on the one hand, uh, the barriers to, to provide this capability are much higher. They, they, these countries require what we call an absorptive capacity, to actually absorb that uh, uh, capacity as well. But also it's less interesting because you're giving the autonomy away and that autonomy security trade-off uh, then breaks down. You don't lock in your alliances anymore. Even you might compete with them in future markets. Now, the key point that, I, that I'm making in this chapter uh, in, in more length than I've done in the past is that that whole conventional wisdom is broken down for cyber. Doesn't apply in the same way. Why is that the case? Well, we have to kind of look at the different elements in turn, right? Because we can't talk about one entity of cyber arms here as I've just previously discussed. But when we first look at exploits and tools, they tend, as I've mentioned uh, in earlier research before, they tend to be transitory in nature. There's a limited time period in which they can be used and that usage then is ultimately also affected by how you're using it. So what do I mean with that? If you are using your exploit against many, many targets, it's much more likely to get discovered. And as a result of that, um, other act, like um, there is a certain time period in which this exploit is more or less valuable. Now, in economic terms, that means that exploits and tools become what they call rivalrous with goods. So a good is rivalrous in economics. When uh, its consumption by one party prevents simultaneous consumption by another party, or if consumption by one party reduces the ability of another party to consume it. Now, with most of military equipment, it's rivalrous to some degree. But the point here with exploits and tools is that they tend to be different in both quantity and quality, as I explained. They are more transitory, but also they are different because of the way in which patching works with two, um, a, in, in simple terms, where one, um, vendor developing a patch, it can lead to security for all. And that changes also the qualitative element of exploits and tools relative to other weapons. Now this changes the incentive structure for transfers because mutual benefits, I would argue, arise only in two specific situations. And these situations do not frequently occur. The first situation is when the following three conditions are met. It's when arms supplying and arms receiving states agree on three aspects of a cyber operation. That's the timing, target, and proportionality. Because in that case, you're willing to share it. Yeah, okay, we agree that we should use it at this specific time against this specific target, and that the usage of this uh, asset leads to this or that effect. The moment you don't align with these three, you don't get the same um, mutual benefit from it from certainly a game theoretical perspective. Now, the second situation is, um, is a different one, which is when the sales of an exploit tool does 
does not reduce one's own national security, that act that and it doesn't have uh, an operational uh, value to you. Um, and of course, it has an operational value to the arms receiving state. In reality, that rarely occurs as well because it's so hard to know that that export really doesn't influence a business or any other entity in your country or other area. So it's a situation that in practice rarely occurs. So there is this bit of a countervailing tension. So I'm introducing one, one other uh, economics term, and I think it's the last one that I have in these, in these slides, which is on the one end, you have these like, um, Exploits and tools are what we say can create a joiners of supply. The opportunity for transforming tools and exploits is much higher as they can be quite effortlessly be replicated and shared. It doesn't require a big industry of, I don't know, uh, ships to transfer uh, all these exploits to another country or you name it. Um, so the cost of supplying a good to the first user is the same or nearly the same as supplying it to many users. That would normally incentivize sharing, but equally it's a rival risk good that allows for a very limited set of uh, cases uh, where you don't easily want to give someone else the opportunity to use it because it affects your own usage. Now, what it also shows is if there is any incentive does exist for state-to-state -state transfer, it's actually in facilitating other states to develop their own capabilities. That is by providing knowledge and expertise, the first element of the PTO framework to adapt weapons technology and provide the capacity to innovate because that doesn't reduce the effectiveness of, facil of uh, facilitating states own arsenal. Uh, two key examples here. The first is the training of personnel. And the second is the sales of testing facilities, so-called cyber ranges. As a policy recommendation, but that's something later, I also think that those are the two areas where we should see way more development and people, because of a lack of, an, lack of understanding of what capacity actually entails, have insufficiently focused, particularly on the second one. But of course, also here in advanced power would only consider this type of transfer with a highly select group of other states that it can trust not to use these capabilities against their interests in the future. So again, it's quite a limited situation, but that's where the potential would lie if you would argue or if you would ask me. So this is a couple of different implications and I put them now on the last, uh, last slide um, of I believe what I have. So first, it kind of explains kind of NATO policy uh, as well, right? Where um, over the past few years, NATO has developed this principle of sovereign cyber effects mechanism, where countries can sign up to provide their sovereign cyber effects to the Alliance in case the need arises. But they don't provide their capabilities, they provide their effects. They don't need to say how they have done it, but only that they can do so. That fits this element that I've discussed here around, um, um, around the rivalrous goods and the countervailing tension that, um, that exists. But of course, what we do see is um, some sharing at least, uh, or some collaboration around training, particularly around these highly publicized cyber exercises. To repeat my point, I don't think that that's sufficiently done. And if I would make an argument, I would create much larger cyber ranges that can be developed uh, across uh, several alliances uh, and be invested in for the training of people, particularly given these countries having a limited cyber strategy where people may not be operating on a day-to-day -day basis, which makes this testing and training even more important. The second implication that follows from it is that there is a difference between espionage operations and, you, and, and sharing tools, uh, exploits and tools for that and effect ops. And that's because there is a higher incentives, there are higher incentives for selling espionage and surveillance tools. That's because of a couple of elements. The first one is discovery. So they are less rivalrous. Deconfliction, you don't want to be, the two of you be in the same system at the same time because you don't know what's gonna happen and it increases attribution potential and also intelligence collection uh, efforts. The third element uh, that, is, um, that is worthy to at least mention here at the end is around attribution. Because there, I do make an assumption here and that is, you could argue, well, I want to share much of my capabilities, some of my capabilities, because it can either lead to, it can, it can ha um, make attribution more difficult. Hey, if we have a wide uh, um, shared pool of capabilities, was it, uh, we've seen this in the intelligence aligned, was it really GHQ or was it maybe the NSA that was behind this? 
well, we're not 100% sure we think it is one or the other, given the geographical location. You can see this happening, but equally that comes with a great deal of risks around misattribution as well. And so the ultimate conclusion that follows um, from here is of course that states will have to rely much more on their own ability to build and innovate, particularly if you compare this to the conventional um, domains. I will leave it here. I realize I've rushed through a couple of different slides and some I talked about a bit more than others. As I mentioned, um, I'm happy to talk about any other elements of the book as well. I would love to, in fact. Um, and thanks again, Monica, uh, Dennis, and everyone else for giving me the opportunity to present you. That was great. Thank you so much, Max.